everyone, this is Nausicaa Sakura. I'm trying something new today. I decided to try to do a voiceover narration, and so let me know in the comments if you like that. The chirping at the start of this video is actually the warbling wide eyes uh, call. Usually when I go to do a large artwork like this, I start off doing a thumbnail image, and what a thumbnail image is, is it's a very small, uh, sketchy kind of mock-up you record your general ideas and work out what kind of composition you would like to have, uh, what should be in this composition, where it should be, what colors should be there. They're very non-committal, so it's very easy at this stage to change your idea or brainstorm other ideas. They're also very useful if you don't have the time to commit to a full artwork right now and you want to not forget that composition that you see in your mind later. That's what I did with the picture that's above this thumbnail. You'll see that I have my phone off to the left and I have Google Images pulled up. When I'm making a drawing, I'm not copying somebody else's drawing. What I'm doing is I'm looking for references for uh, birds. When I made this thumbnail image, the bird that I was specifically looking for was a Japanese bush warbler. They're very common birds to be hearing during springtime, and they're a common trope with cherry blossoms in traditional Japanese artwork. I ended up changing my mind and not using that bird, because when I was looking up images of that bird, I found another variety of bird that is present in Japan at spring, which is a greener color, and that's the warbling wide eye. I thought that the colors complemented the composition a lot better and helped me bring that green around in an otherwise highly pink image. Japanese bush warblers are more traditionally associated with very, very early spring and are more commonly associated with plum blossoms. Plum is a symbol of winter, so it's the transition of winter into very early spring. But these birds are present in Japan throughout most of the year in the first place and still actively nesting throughout most of the year from what I've been reading. When I was making my thumbnail image, I was trying to keep in mind the themes that I wanted to depict. April of 2020 was home to my birthday, Easter, and the Cherry Blossom Festival. Now, the Cherry Blossom Festival in Japan isn't any particular day, and it changes throughout the regions of Japan because the peak blooming time for cherry blossoms is at various different times depending on the climate. Here, where I live in California, I commute to San Francisco with a group of my friends and uh, participate in San Francisco's annual cherry blossom festival. The final Sunday of San Francisco's cherry blossom festival happened to also be the same day as my birthday, but because of preventative measures against COVID-19, the annual Cherry Blossom Festival had sadly but responsibly been cancelled. This is why I created this picture, posted the picture for Easter, and then posted the YouTube video for this picture on my birthday with a live premiere set so that I could interact with people as a sort of virtual birthday party on the morning of my birthday. You'll see I also attempted to do another composition that I had in my head, but as I was beginning to sketch it out, I decided to, you know, abandon mission on that composition because I wasn't liking it. But I think it's very important to attempt a few different compositional designs, especially different perspectives, because you can very often get stuck in a rut and you just do them subconsciously out of habit. And you'll, you can find that in trying these different methods, one, you get the practice of attempting to look at these things a different way so that hopefully you can break that habit, but also you can choose you like a composition better that would fit that picture better and then you create a better image because of it, or you can reaffirm your initial decision on your original vision. You can make much more confident choices and better artwork when you can plan it out in this way. Beside my thumbnail, I was also sketching various drafts of how I could do the buns on Baby's head. I knew that I wanted to play with the buns to make them look like bunny ears. Unfortunately, by consequence, this draws a significant parallel to the character Chibi Usa in uh, Sailor Moon, which Baby is also very commonly compared to. They are different characters, I promise. <laughs> I actually made a doodle in a previous sketchbook that was playing with the idea of how similar they consequently are to each other, but also showing that they are indeed different characters and I draw them in different ways. When I create my sketches, I'm actually not pressing hard to create these dark lines. I'm sketching very lightly with my pencil 
and where the lines are darker, I've actually just gone over a few more times with that light pressure. This way, the lines that I want to keep darken, but they're not imprinted into the paper and I can easily lift them off with an eraser later. I always sketch with pencil first, and then I go over with ink and erase the pencil underneath. Because of this, I have to use an ink that is fade resistant and dries quickly, which is why I like Sakura Pigma inks. Sakura Pigma inks are also archival, which means they will be less likely to deteriorate over time as compared to other non-archival materials. My older artwork was being created with non-archival materials not because of necessarily preference, but because I didn't have the money to purchase these archival materials on a regular basis. I'm currently transitioning to more archival papers, as this one is. But that's the thing. To create good art isn't necessarily up to what materials you're using. You could use the most expensive archival professional materials and still not be creating very good artwork because you did not refine your skills. My earlier artwork that is posted online which is a very similar quality to what I do now, I actually was creating with Crayola colored pencils, which is a school children's brand. Prismacolor colored pencils are what I use now. They are archival, they are professional, and they, they are expensive. And they are much easier to blend. But I first learned how to perfect my blending with Crayola colored pencils, which made the job harder to do. So that when I started using the Prismacolors, I already had that skill set in place. It's not because of the medium that I'm able to blend so well. It's because I've practiced that skill set and I was able to do that, you know, on the cheap. There wasn't an excuse. You can still get well blended materials if you put in the effort and the work and the time to practice doing so. So don't let that ever get in your way. Once I have the lines that I want to keep in place and I've erased my pencil marks, I go in and make variations in line weight. Where lines converge and where I want something to appear more heavy, I will create a thicker line which gives it a feeling of heaviness to weigh it down. And it helps define that converging edge and separate the two things that are converging. It also creates a lot more visually interesting image when it's just a black and white ink drawing. It's a method very commonly used in comic books, and since this is a illustration that comes from a sort of comic book canon, I still employ those skill sets into my drawing. While the characters in the foreground are very crisply depicted with ink, I decided to try an impressionistic approach with the background. The impressionistic approach also allows me to use a sort of atmospheric perspective, so things that are farther away look blurrier than those things that are closer to you. As you can see, I'm suggesting the presence of cherry blossoms on the branches without actually going in and individually drawing each blossom. That would take too much time, and it's honestly fairly needless. I also create very high saturation when I work because that's a stylistic choice. However, I keep in mind realism. When I create works that are illustrative, I still have an idea of reality in the back of my head. For instance, something I learned when taking mainstream art courses in college was that the sky isn't just blue. The sky isn't just those sunset -y colors that are transitioning because there's a sunset. There's actually a transition from the horizon up to the mid sky. And making that transition is what makes your sky not look like a backdrop. And that transition happens largely because of the placement of the sun as a light source in the sky. That transition is also not just a value transition, but it's also a color transition because the light is bouncing off the various particles in the atmosphere. And then there's reflected light that interacts with that as well. Once I've established what colors I want in my sky transition, for this one it was very faintly a violet blue and a blue into a very slight green and a pale yellow. So for the most part, the colors were a pale blue and a pale yellow. I decided to then take the light that would have reflected off of those colors, the light that would have reflected off of the sky and bounced onto my character 
and I lightly placed that reflective color around the image to help make her exist within this environment, within this world. Characters aren't just superimposed into place. There's an interaction with the world around them, even if that's not a literal interaction. As I go into color, I very often will start with my darks and then layer on my light. So I work with colored pencils, which are essentially colored wax. A lot like how a digital artist will work in layers, I think about working in layers when I do my colored pencil artwork. I lightly place in my darks and then I will go over that with my base color and blending with the previous layer. Some people like to work light to dark, I like to work dark to light. For most things. It's really up to experience for you to discover which method you like best. Keeping in mind, your first pass can always change. It's a lot easier to darken something than it is to lighten something later, especially when you have layers of wax with colored pencil, because if you press hard, as people will often try to do when they blend, I'm very guilty of this myself, I have a very heavy hand, you can actually start to lift off previous layers of the wax or push them away so it's no longer blending well. I use this to my advantage, however, in depicting the wicker basket. So I, I laid down my reflected colors, I laid down what's considered undertones, and then I put that brown to yellow transition on top of that. And I was using a white pencil to push the previous darker layers away to create that wicker pattern. I use undertones very commonly in the skin, and each of my characters, I have specific undertones that I tend to work with with their skin. So for instance, say you have three different people who are all pale. Uh, they go by a foundation or a cover-up. They look at the different pale cosmetics that are available. Even though the value of their skin is the same pale value, they still may each need to pick a different foundation because oh, the first person's undertones are very pink. They have very pink pale skin. The next person might have a lot of yellow undertones. They have a more yellowed pale skin. And the third person might have more of a beige undertone. So they'll want to have more beige pale foundation. They're all the same value, but the undertone colors in their skin are different. That's what I'm playing with with the darks. I'm laying down those undertones when I make my first pass of shading the skin. For this character, Babylon, shortened to baby, her undertones are largely magenta. Because there was so much pink already present in this image, I decided to take that magenta, which is a red violet, and make it lean more towards a true violet just to help with that distinction and create more of a color variation throughout the image. One thing I really took away from university is that you shouldn't just focus on one portion of your picture and then move on to the next portion and then the next portion as if it's a formula. You really should bounce around in the image and that will really help you create that color variation throughout your image while at the same time retaining that they exist within the same space because certain colors are not localized. When light hits that object and bounces off that object, it transfers some of that color onto the surface of a neighboring object. So that same green that's on the bird will probably be present elsewhere that that light is then reflecting off onto, such as baby space, the highlights of her hair. There's also the fact that colors inform each other. There's a very common optical illusion where Say you have two squares of the same 50% gray. If you show that same 50% gray over a black background next to the same 50% gray over a white background and ask somebody which gray is lighter, they're very likely to pick a gray square that's over the black background. The reason for this is that that gray is interacting with that black when you're looking at it, or that gray is interacting with that white when you look at it. That gray, in context to the much darker black background, appears lighter by contrast. That same gray in the context of the white background looks much darker 
compared to the white context. The same thing happens with colors. When you look at the color wheel, the ones that are opposite of each other are considered complementary colors. This means that when those colors are present together, they intensify how those colors are perceived. So red and green are complementary colors. So if you take that same experiment with color involved, if you have that red square over a green background and that same red square over an orange background, orange is a secondary color, which is the mixture of red and yellow. That background already has some red mixed in with it to create that orange color, whereas green has no red in it at all. So that red square on top of the green background looks more red than the red that's on top of the orange background. This is what I mean by colors interact with each other. The way you perceive a color is in many ways dependent on the other colors that are present in its context. With skin, I'll typically start with the reflected light from the environment around, then the undertone, then possibly a transitional color to help that color fade and blend into what will be the base color of the skin. In this case, I used an orange to kind of help neutralize that violet color and help transition it into a more yellow peachy color. I then carried on with the base color of the skin, which was a light peach, keeping in mind where the highlights from the light source are going to be on the skin, where that would be paler. For different skin tones, I would also then use a paler color in that highlighted portion, but for baby skin, it was already so pale to begin with that that area largely was just the white paper mixed with whatever reflected light was being cast onto it. I did, however, soften the edges with my white colored pencil. You'll notice as I made the translation from the thumbnail image onto the actual drawing, there are some minor changes that happen. One of the more notable ones is the placement of the birds. I thought that the actual size of the bird wasn't being very well depicted in the thumbnail image, and so I attempted to correct this in the actual artwork. But that change in size also changed its position slightly, and I did not like that overlap. I wanted to fill in an empty space, so I tried a few different variations while I was still in the sketching phase and I found one that I liked, which also helped create more depth because you have the further away bird and then you have the closer bird and you can tell which one's closer because one, the closer bird is overlapping my character, baby, and two, it's much larger in comparison to the one that's further away. These are basic rules of perspective that ring true for all varieties of artwork. I'm a very big proponent of all art informs each other. So if you want to improve your illustration, learn realism. You want to improve your realism, learn cubism. It forces us to look at the world in a different way than we otherwise have become accustomed to. And there's a lot of value in looking at something with new eyes and new perspective. Reflected light is something that it's very difficult for beginners to grasp. <laughs> and it's even more difficult for people who feel that they're an established artist who've just never been aware of the nature of reflected light up until now. Say there's a red ball. We know it's a red ball. We see it. We say that's a red ball. The pigment that was put into the plastic of that ball was a red color. It's a red ball. When we go to draw that red ball, we make that ball red because that's the color it is. But for some reason, that image doesn't really look entirely like it would in real life. And it takes time to unprogram your mind and see what's actually there, what's actually going on. Because I can almost guarantee you that that red ball is not truly red. That red ball has light that's reflecting off of the environment around it. And that colored light visually is mixing with the base red color of that ball. So a portion of that ball may actually be a red violet. A portion of that ball may actually be brown. A portion of that ball might actually be green. It could be any number of colors and all transitioning around with each other. But when they're put together in context, it looks red. For these same reasons, her white dress is not truly white. I think there's very little space on that dress where it actually is a true white. I did that first pass of reflected light from the sky. 
Then I did another pass of a gray to mark out where I want the shading to be. And then I was going in with various different colors while I was working on the image and choosing what colors go where in the rest of the image and then reflecting those colors back onto the dress and saturating them more where that shadow would be. When I became more confident with the color and value placement, I would then blend them together using my white color pencil, which obviously, consequently, will pale it up a little bit, though I, I work and compensate for that. With my illustrations, I'm not doing cell coloring. Cell coloring is one pass of color, it's a block of color, and then you could have a block of shading underneath that to help try to define that more three-dimensionally. This is the method that was used with traditional animation cells. Each frame was a cell, which was like a transparent plastic sheet, and then pigments were painted on top of that. They were overlapped, photographed, slightly adjusted, overlapped again, slightly adjusted, photographed again, and then played in a very fast succession to each other to create the animation. Cell shading was used in this because it was fairly easy, cheap, and time effective to replicate. And it did the job it needed to do. The fine artist in me wants to elevate my illustrations to a level somewhat beyond that. I enjoy transitioning colors. I enjoy the variety of colors that are present in an environment. So I take that from reality, I bring it into my illustration, and then I toy with it. I increase the saturation. Sometimes I invent colors that aren't really there just because I like how it looks. But the point is, is that I have that foundation of knowledge in reality that I'm then purposely choosing to alter to get the effect that I want for my audience. That effect is not a consequence. That effect is a choice. That's something that I really love about illustration in general is that there's a basis in reality and then that reality is then purposely exaggerated to translate something visually and instantly to the viewer. Baby is perhaps mirroristically my most elegant character, and so she has a lot of features that are borrowed from, for instance, fashion models, where they have very elongated necks and limbs, which in the context of fashion illustration was used to show off more of the garment. So the average viewer will visually or subconsciously make that parallel. It's very natural for humans to compare things, even subconsciously. So when someone sees my character with her elongated limbs, subconsciously they may be referencing images of fashion illustration. And then the emotions and feelings that they associate with fashion illustration are then transferred from that memory into how they are perceiving my character. I had mentioned the comparison of Shibiusa in Sailor Moon to my character Baby before, but if you look at specifically the original manga for Sailor Moon, you'll notice that the style in which that, that manga is drawn also is with the very elongated and elegant limbs that are calling back to fashion illustration. Big eyes are a very common trope with anime characters and larger heads to accommodate that. The way that the large eyes are depicted are in a variety of different ways, and they each give their own different effects. But generally, the canon or the guideline in anime of having enlarged eyes and larger eyes for younger characters and more innocent characters and more feminine characters, it plays with psychology in a very similar way, wherein when you're born as a baby, your eyes are pretty much the size they're going to be the rest of your life. Your skull will still slightly be expanding as you grow older and the cartilage hardens into bone. But the adult-sized eyes inside a smaller skull, by context, makes the eyes look bigger in that skull than they do in a adult face. So the enlarged eyes on the face subconsciously makes the viewer think of infants. And the feelings associated with infants are then projected onto the character. The most notable thing that's being projected is an idea of innocence, that when a baby does something wrong that hurts you, you don't chalk it up to being a personal fault or that they had intended to actually hurt you. You instantly forgive that infant because you know they don't know better yet. It wasn't something that they were intending to do. They were not inherently evil. That's why 
even more significantly, enlarged eyes are used commonly with younger characters, innocent characters, and many times feminine characters, since in the Western world, innocence, kindness, and caring is a trait associated as a feminine quality with gender stereotypes. Here I did some old school copy and paste. I held my paper up towards the lamp and traced the lines that I wanted to keep. I traced a little bit beyond that as a guideline as well, and then put it back on top of the image and drew the changes that I wanted to make. I went through the usual process of sketching, inking, and before I started coloring I actually cut out both the image that I wanted to keep and also the sections that would mask the previous drawing. I then glued this in place. Once the glue secured, I went on to coloring, trying to make sure that the seams of the different layers of paper were as minimally noticeable as possible. After I finished all of my colored pencil work, there's so many layers of colored wax on top of my original ink that the ink looks so pale. A benefit to this is that in paling the lines out, it forces me to work with value and color transition a lot more in order to make forms distinguished from other forms and make things look like they're turning in space. However, I like the callback to comic illustration that the lines give. And so I put those back in my image with the use of a cheaper archival ink pen, which is Sharpie. Sharpie ink bleeds very easily onto paper, which absorbs it like super fast. But because this is a wax layer, that issue doesn't really happen. What I do have to be very careful of, however, is that because I'm laying the Sharpie ink over wax, if I press just even slightly too hard, I run the risk of clogging the nib of the pen with the wax. And that happens very commonly. This is why I have a piece of scrap paper off to the side and I'm regularly wiping whatever residue I get on the nib off onto that paper and attempting to get a steady stream of ink again. I do the same thing when I move on to doing gel pen to create those white lines. I'm regularly having to unclog the nib. And the nice thing with the gel pen is that not only am I unclogging the nib, but I try to get that steady stream of gel and then quickly bring my pen up so that I have a bead of gel left on the tip of the pen. And then I drag that bead across the layers of wax. Inevitably, I end up ruining a number of pens because I've just clogged them so much. And that's another really great reason to have cheap pens for this stage so that I'm not having to keep up with buying my more expensive ones. I can't afford that. <laughs> Sharpies are also fast drying, so I don't run a very high risk of smearing it across the layers of wax as I work. You can see my broken little iPod off to the side. My phone does not have any option for you to manually adjust the focus, and it's just always slightly out of focus. My old iPod is too old to use any applications anymore, but it has a very good camera. So what I do is I photograph my artwork with my iPod. I email that file to myself. I access that email and download the image on my phone. And then I use my phone that has no cellular service. I just have it on Wi-Fi to then post to social media. The iPod also allows me to edit the image a lot better than the phone, so I edit the image on the iPod as well. Normally I only put the scanned version that I've edited at the end of my videos, but for this one particularly, since I've gotten in more of a habit of taking photographs of the artwork as opposed to scans, because the photographs will show colors more true to what they are, I put the photograph of the artwork and then I put the scan of the artwork. The benefit of the scan is that the lines are very crisp and because there's not that distortion of perspective and reflected light from the environment around it, it's a much more crisp image to understand. I can also easily then use it to create prints. But again, no matter what you do, there's always something lost in translation from the original product. That's what makes seeing artwork in galleries and in person so valuable because inevitably there's not going to be any kind of replication of that artwork that is true to the original. We can try to get as close as we can, but it will never be exactly the same. This is something that people really like about digital art because of it being more replicatable. Even though screens will may show the image differently, as well as different printers printing out slightly differently as well. 
But that translation seems to be a lot truer than when you're trying to replicate traditional media. But at the same time, that increases the value of the traditional media artwork. My choice of working in traditional media isn't because of that perceived value, however. It's that it's the medium that I most enjoy working with. You can see from my ending animation here, like, I, I do know how to work digitally. It's just because of financial restrictions affecting what technology I have available to me. That's a factor. And also, I just really enjoy the traditional medium. I like the physicality of working with it. Thank you so much for watching this video. Let me know in the comments below whether you liked this and would like more. Or if not, you know, constructive criticism is always welcome. Please and thank you. I hope you have a good day, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!